All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our latest installment of Florida Talks at Home. My name is Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director at Florida Humanities, and we have a really special program for you tonight with Dr. Steve Knoll. He's going to be talking about democracy in Florida. This talk is part of um, our ongoing exhibit with the Smithsonian Institution um, on democracy, and I'm going to have some information down in the description or in the in the uh, chat um, if you're interested in learning more about that exhibit. Um, Florida Humanities is starting to partner with humanities organizations across Florida to provide more of these Florida Talks at Home programs. Most of these programs will take virtually. Um, others that are taking place in person will do so observing appropriate distancing guidelines. Uh, but we ultimately just want you to know about all the events that we have coming up so far in 2021. So uh, you can visit floridahumanities.org slash events to see the most current list of events that we have um, in that we have coming up right now. Uh, I want to take a moment to spotlight a series of special programs we have coming up with our friends at the Village Square and Braver Angels. Now, all of these programs are designed to help us identify political differences and develop communication skills that bridge the divide. Um, it's certainly something that's needed in the wake of our contentious election in 2020, as well as the events that occurred on January 6th of this year. Um, the first program in this series is going to take place on February 4th, and it's a conversation between Florida, for, former Florida U.S. Congressman David Jolly and Patrick Murphy. They're talking about 10 pressing political challenges that they have identified that continue to plague the American electorate today. So you can see more about that event, other events in that series, and again, all the other events that we're sponsoring in 2021 by going to floridahumanities.org slash events. Now, at the end of tonight's presentation, you will receive a short feedback survey in your email. And we'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes to fill it out for us. Um, it's a way that we get feedback to know what you liked, what we could do better on next time. And if you have any questions, by the way, for the speaker, feel free to add them into the chat, and we're going to do our best to get to as many questions as possible uh, before the end of tonight's program. And your support, by the way, is essential to helping programs like this be possible. If you enjoyed tonight's program, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org support to contribute to our organization. Now, tonight, we welcome Dr. Steve Knoll, a master lecturer in the history department at the University of Florida. Dr. Knoll has written extensively on general Florida history, as well as more specialized subjects ranging from Florida's environmental policy, the ill-flated cross Florida barge canal, and the disability rights movement of the 1970s. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Knoll. Thanks, Keith. Happy to be here. Um, happy to work again with Florida Humanities. It's a great organization. And as Keith has said, um, if you're a Floridian and you like the program and you like what the humanities, Florida Humanities are doing, go to their website and please think about supporting them because what they do is really, is really important within the state, especially in these times. So this program um, was developed in conjunction with a, uh, um, an exhibit around the state through the Smithsonian and Florida Humanities and local museums called MOMS, Museums on Main Street, um, and it's called Democracy, Voices, and Votes. Um, and this um, program is, that's a national one. So this exhibit could be in Florida, it could be in Nebraska, it could be in North Dakota. This, um, and my talk is geared towards taking the large national picture of democracy and relating it specifically to democracy in Florida. And I titled mine, um, Democracy in Florida, colon, because all great historical works have to have colons there, a work in progress. And certainly um, this work has changed rather dramatically from the first time I gave it, which was a year ago um, when we still could do things in person uh, at the Daytona um, Museum of Arts and Sciences. Um, things have changed. And so um, much of what I'm going to talk about, or some of what I'm going to talk about, reflects those changes um, in democracy in America and the, the events of the past two months that really have put democracy uh, both in Florida and in the nation 
uh, in peril. So with that, I want to put the events of the past two months into some kind of historical perspective, um, both nationwide, but specifically looking at Florida. So um, with that, um, I will start the presentation. Hopefully my cat Weasley will not jump up here. Um, if he does on my lap, that's okay. But if he jumps in the back and destroys all my wires, we may not be finished. So with that, um, let's start. We're going to start Florida's um, democracy um, at a time period when Florida was still uh, a colony of Spain. Um, and Florida as a colony of Spain uh, sees itself as a sanctuary for runaway slaves from the English colonies, first of South Carolina and later uh, in the 18th century of Georgia. And so at some point, Florida's democracy really starts even before uh, it's an English colony and before certainly it's an American nation as it encourages and entices those people who are enslaved to come to Florida and become free, to become part of a society in which they can participate. Um, as opposed to being enslaved people in um, in Georgia or South Carolina or even North Carolina or even Virginia, which is really strange because Florida itself is a slave society. But uh, the Spanish are encouraging and enticing these slaves to come to Florida, not so much because they care about them, but because they see this as a way of hurting the English um, opportunities within their colonies in British North America. So um, Fort Mose is the first um, fully established free black settlement in what will be the United States. Um, and it is just north of St. Augustine. It is established by runaway slaves from, as I said, Georgia and South Carolina. Um, it is established in the 1730s um, as, as part of this um, enticement by the Spanish, which started in the 1690s. So Fort Mose is this location, um, actually called Grasa, Grasa Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, um, which means established by the, the um, at the grace of the king. Um, and Mose is the place north of St. Augustine. There's now a historic state park that you can go visit. And if you're uh, in Florida, um, and when, when the pandemic is over and the, and the lockdown is over, go and visit it. It's a really interesting place. And tied into that is this man. Um, maybe the most interesting person, not a Dos Equis commercial, but maybe the most interesting person in all of colonial America, more interesting than George Washington, more interesting than Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Menendez, not his original name. Uh, we don't know his original name. He's born in, in Africa. He is captured and brought into slavery um, into South Carolina in the first decades of the 18th century. He runs away and escapes to Florida um, and becomes the captain of the militia at Fort Mose in 1738. He's a leading person in the uh, fight and struggle against George's attack, General Jam James Oglethorpe's attack. Um, in 1739. And in 1738, he petitions the king for land because I have been a nice supporter of Spain and the king, and which tells us A, that he is literate, and B, that he knows the connections. He's not writing to the governor. He's not writing to the lieutenant governor. He's writing to the king. And the king agrees, gives him some land, and Menendez becomes an important part of this struggle against English attack. Two years later, he ships out on a Spanish privateer to attack English shipping uh, in the Gulf Stream. Guess what? His privateer is captured by uh, an English ship, an English uh, man of war. He is put back into slavery again uh, in the Bahamas. He escapes again, goes back to Florida and becomes, um, becomes uh, the commander of the militia at Fort Mose again for the second time. In 1763, Spain cedes Florida to England as a result of their loss in the Seven Years' War. So Florida becomes an English colony. With that, many of the people who are living under Spanish rule, including Menendez and the people within the community of Fort Mose, leave Spanish Florida and go to Cuba, where he establishes a another community there where he dies in Cuba. In 1783, when Spain takes back 
uh, Florida from the English. Menendez's children come back to Florida. So it's an amazing story, a story that is remarkable in the fact that this man had, had lived such a, an interesting life, speaks many languages, and is, is um, really representative of, of the push for democracy. Okay, so, all right, what, uh, so in, why don't we skip the slide here? I don't know why. Why did we skip a slide here, Keith? Okay, all right, now, never mind, never mind. Okay, sorry, technology at its worst. So Spain, Spain returns to control of Florida in 1783, okay? And the Spanish world is rocked by the French Revolution, by changes with Napoleon, and by the um, second decade of the 19th century, Spain has moved towards a constitutional monarchy and establishes the first liberal democratic constitution in continental Europe, okay? Um, and with that, Spain says all the colonies need to recognize the fact that we've got this liberal democratic uh, constitutional monarchy in Spain. And so in the plaza of, of the constitution in St. Augustine, still there is this monument to the Constitution of 1812, a monument to Spanish democracy. Two years later, guess what? Spain falls to Napoleon. Napoleon puts his brother on the throne. The Spanish Constitution is removed, turns back to authoritarian rule, and they call up on their cell phone to Florida and say, hey, guess what? Get rid of the damn monument. All monuments to this Spanish Constitution in the colonies are to be removed. Everyone is removed except the one in St. Augustine. The only extant monument to this Spanish liberal democratic constitution is in St. Augustine. So if you want to visit it, there's one other in Spain, in Cadiz, where the, where the constitution was established. So there are two in the world, one right here in Florida. So 1819, Florida becomes part of the United States an ongoing struggle uh, during the second Spanish period in which the United States wants to take it over. Um, I think the wheels of bureaucracy turn slowly now. It takes two years for this to take place. From uh, 1819 to 1821, Florida is in this transition period from Spanish rule to American rule. So Florida becomes part of the United States officially in uh, 1821 with the adams onis Treaty. And Florida is now a territory of the United States. So part of this democratic Republic of the United States. It's a territory. It is frontier, okay? Not many people live here. It takes over 20 years for Florida to become, from move from territory to state. But Florida's democratic ethos is important during this time period as we see the fact that the first Hispanic member of Congress expanding this notion of what it means to be a citizen comes from Florida, Joseph Hernandez, born um, um, during British rule, then comes into Spanish rule, then comes into American rule. His name at birth is Jose Mariano Hernandez. After 1821, he changes his name to Joseph Hernandez and becomes the Florida territorial representative to the United States Congress. First Hispanic person there. Okay. So that sounds really good. We're expanding the polity, letting Hispanics in. Well, he's also a slave owner and a slaveholder. He's a plantation owner. And uh, his plantation is still, um, the remains of it are still um, up there today in Flagler County. You can go and visit those as well. As well. It's called Mala Compra, which means in Spanish, bad bargain. And actually, it's a pretty good bargain. So um, he not only is the first Hispanic delegate to the United States Congress, um, he is, then becomes a representative of the Territorial Congress of the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, Territorial Representative of Florida. He becomes a Brigadier General in the in the Second Seminole War. He is involved in the capture of Osceola. So, I mean, he's a big, important character, right? Um, he is also involved in the, the establishment of Florida's first constitution, the 1838 constitution, which is um, drafted um, in a place called St. Joseph, Florida, okay? Um, he's there. This constitution is established um, seven years before Florida becomes a state in the anticipation that Florida will become a state. And this constitution, again, expands expands 
voting citizenship to all white men. Okay, and that what's white mean? That's interesting. Obviously, it means Hispanic in Florida. So um, certainly, though, not to African-American men who are slaves, nor to women as well. And certainly in this time period, um, in this time period um, of 1838, we also see issues that relate to things that are going on today. This city, which at this point is the third largest city in Florida, by 1840 is deserted. The governor a man named Robert Reed, who is at this constitutional convention, is dead. Why? The city, why is the city gone? Why is Reed dead? Pandemic. Yellow fever epidemic takes over the city of, of, um, of St. Joseph, wipes it out. Governor dead. So stuff like this is happening at this point as well. Okay. Um, another important person in both territorial and statehood Florida during this time period from 1821 until 1860 is David Levy Uly. Again, like Mr. Hernandez, he is not considered to be a white person. He's a Jew. He's a Sephardic Jew who was born in St. Thomas, moves to Florida with his father, um, Moses Levy, who establishes this strange attempt at a Jewish utopian colony in the middle of Florida, in the middle of the Second Seminole War. Bad choice on both accounts. He fails, but his son, who takes the name David Levy Uly, becomes an important person in Florida's territorial and statehood growth. He is a plantation owner, so he is a slaveholder. He also builds the first railroad across the state of Florida. He doesn't build it. He provides the financial backing for it. His African-American slaves and other hired slaves do this. And David Uly becomes the first Jewish person to serve in the United States Congress. He is Florida's first senator when it becomes a state in 1845. So Uly, again, an important person in expanding the notion of what it means to be a white person, a person who can vote, okay? So Uly is this important character. Um, the town of Uly named after him, Levy County named after him, big thing in Fernandina named after him. So he's an important person. Um, when the Civil War comes about, he becomes, uh, joins the South. In fact, he is such an important person in the South that after the war is over, he is actually imprisoned for his support of the Confederacy. And there's rumors that on his plantation called Cottonwood, which is in Archer, Florida, just west of Gainesville, that this is where Jefferson Davis was heading when he was captured um, in Irwinville, Georgia. Um, at the end of the Civil War. And the rumors are that Confederate gold is hidden in Cottonwood Plantation. So periodically, all these characters go out there with their metal detectors looking for Confederate gold. So um, this is what Florida was, both as a territory and as a state. In 1860, to tell you how many people Florida has, it's got 140,000 people. That's almost nothing, right? But of that, 44% are African-American slaves. 61,000 people are held in bondage in this state. So while Florida is democratic in the fact that it's universal white male suffrage, it is a slave state. And on people say, well, Florida is not part of the South. It's just in the South. It's part of the South. Okay. So you can see from these two signs, they're auctioning off African-American Negroes. Sorry, that's um, boys, men, and women on the courthouse steps in Jacksonville, Florida in 1860. And also a $50 reward, which is a significant amount of money for runaway slave in Tampa. And Tampa's in the middle of nowhere. Understand, Tampa is absolutely in the middle of nowhere when the Civil War starts, okay? So um, while this is happening in, in 1860, Florida um, secedes from the Union and you know becomes part of a society based almost exclusively on white supremacy. And the president of the secession convention held in January of, um, of 1861, uh, he's from Alachua County, he's a plantation owner. And he says this, I mean, if people tell you, you, know, you go home and talk to your grandmother, talk to your grandson, and they say, oh, it's all about states' rights. Well, listen to what he says. At the South and with the people, of course, slavery is the element of all value, and the destruction of that destroys all that is of property. So important stuff. So Florida secedes from the Union 
in a cause that will keep African Americans in bondage. Right? War's over. Four years, Florida fights on the losing side. Governor John Milton um, and the town of Milton in the Panhandle, named after him, uh, died in the wool secessionist, um, can't stand to live in a society in which slavery will be defeated and the North has won the war. So he goes back to his plantation in Jackson County near Mariana and blows his head off. Okay, his message is death would be preferable to reunion. Talking about, you know, this is really wild stuff on how important slavery is to these people and how unimportant the idea of universal democracy is to these individuals. So when this is happening, the key to the Civil War is freeing the slaves. 61,000 individuals are now free. So what are they? Well, they're not slaves. We know that. 13th Amendment tells us that. But what are they? Are they citizens? Can they vote? Can they serve on juries? Can they carry weapons? Can they marry? Can they marry, God forbid, white people? This is the, the question that resonates throughout Florida and the nation for the next 150 years, and it's still resonating today. What is the place of these formerly enslaved people within a society? We know they're not slaves, but what are they? And certainly the first answer to that is the 1865 Constitution. Florida's back in the union, right? And this is what the Constitution says. No person shall be a representative unless he be a white man. Senator shall be chosen the, the white man. White of suffrage, white man, okay? And one more point, so if, if you know, one more part. This is another part of this constitution. And it says, the General Assembly shall in the year 1867 and every, five, uh, every seven years after that and every 10th year after that cause an enumeration to be made of the inhabitants of the state. So they're passing a state census, which into the 1960s was done every 10 years. So federal census, 18, uh, 1900, 1910, this year, 2020, state census, 1965, 1955. So this is how the census is going to be done. An enumeration is to be made of all the inhabitants of the state to the whole number of white inhabitants shall be added three-fifths of the number of colored people. Okay, so back to the Constitution, 1787, the three-fifths clause, this horrific three-fifths clause that black people are three-fifths. Now slavery's over and Florida is still saying that blacks can be counted as only three-fifths of a person. This is the 1865 Constitution. It is rejected by the powers that be in Washington and said, the North won the Civil War, black people at least have to have some rights. So three years later, a second Constitution, very different. Every male person, regardless of race, color, nationality, or previous condition, shall be a citizen of the United States and be able to vote, unless, of course, they're a woman, right? So this is a very different thing and opens up Reconstruction, democracy for the first time for African Americans. And on top of that, offers the opportunity for Native American Seminoles to participate in government in Tallahassee, that they should, they have two seats, one in the, in the House of Representatives, one in the Senate. Seminoles never participate in this, and these seats are never filled, okay? But because of this constitution, because of the opportunities that developed there, people like Josiah T. Walls, former slave from Virginia, now can not only participate in government and vote, but can serve in Congress. And Josiah T. Walls is Florida's first black congressman. Um, and the now the um, the election building in Alachua County, which is Gainesville, which is where Walls is from, um, is now in 2016 renamed after him. And you know, there's a marker downtown, and I used to tell my students before COVID, go and try and find the Josiah T. Walls sign um, along West University Avenue. Walls, of course, because this is Florida, all of Walls' elections are disputed, um, claims of election fraud on all sides. Um, Walls finally is um, voted out of office in 1876 when Reconstruction is over. Um, and Walls ends up being a, a professor of agronomy at what will become Florida a and when Walls is voted out of office in 1876, Reconstruction ends with the corrupt bargain election of 1876 and the Compromise of 1877. So with that, 
white bourbon democratic, big D democratic rule comes back. White supremacy is back and a new constitution is put in place. Okay. A constitution which can't say that blacks can't vote because that's against the 15th amendment, but can really prevent that from happening. So how about this? Section 24, all marriages between a white person and a Negro are hereby prohibited. Okay. And this section eight, the legislature shall have the power to make a capitation tax. That means that's a poll tax. So the poll tax is put in place basically to prevent African Americans from voting without saying blacks can't vote. It basically says poor people can't vote. And since most blacks in Florida and the South as a whole are um, sharecroppers, they don't have much money. They're not going to be able to pay the poll tax. So therefore, guess what? This systematically disfranchises thousands of African Americans from the voting rolls without ever saying we're doing it to take blacks away. So this is the constitution that establishes white rule, the establishment of that rule called Jim Crow into the 1960s. And this constitution will be into the state of Florida into the 1960s till it's replaced by one in 1968, which is rather incredible. Um, allows for no lieutenant governor, which is important as we'll see later on. And certainly with this, it provides the removal of the last African-American judge, a man who served in Key West named James Dean. Um, not that James Dean, okay, but this James Dean. And of course, the only colored lawyer in Key West, okay. Got, has his law degree from Howard, now the alma mater of the incoming vice president of the United States, right? Um, and he becomes a judge and he is removed from office because of this. He presides over the marriage between a white person and a Negro, and therefore he is removed from office in 1886. Okay, Removed from office by Governor Francis Fleming. And if you're from Jacksonville, Fleming Island is named after this man. Okay? It takes until 2002 that Jeb Bush posthumously reinstates Dean to his office by saying that he was summarily removed for the wrong reasons. So at some level, very interesting, democracy works in strange ways. And the 1885 constitution certainly ties into the notion of convict leasing. Among Florida's most horrific things, as significant numbers of African-Americans are systematically arrested and for things like vagrancy, which is not having a job, for things like stealing chickens, okay? They're arrested and they are not put in jail because jail's expensive. We don't want to have jail. So they are charged. They are, they are, instead of going to jail, they have to pay a fine. They can't pay a fine. That fine is paid by this nice man sitting in the back of the courthouse who will pay their fine. And then these people have to work off the fine, okay? Oftentimes, they do not even work off the fine. They are worked to death. Convict leasing is an important part of Florida's economic growth in the late 19th, early 20th century. It is a blot on the state. And hundreds, if not thousands, of African-American convicts die under this system. It ends in 1923 when a white man named Martin Tabor, who is arrested in Tallahassee for having a job, he is traveling through the state and um, on a train, he's arrested, charged with vagrancy. Uh, he he um, wires his parents for money. By the time they send him the money, he already has been um, sentenced. His, his, his fees have been picked up by a, 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 um, a man who runs a labor camp in Dixie County and he is worked to death and beaten. And um, because it's a white person, guess what? The, the country is mortified and convict leasing ends. It's a blot on the state and certainly a blot on democracy. Um, and the other part of Jim Crow is systematic, certainly disfranchisement from voting, but legalized segregation. And when we talk about democracy as an important part of democracy, it's being able to work through the system to change. And so in 1905, Florida passes a law that says that um, streetcars, buses, right? The, the um, ancestor of buses are gonna be segregated. African-American people, 
work to get this changed through the law, okay? Amazingly, they work to get it through the law and using the 14th Amendment, they get this law declared unconstitutional. Amazing that, you know, that blacks who are systematically disfranchised, put in a, a subservient position, that they can use the law to change the law, okay? But of course, what happens the law is rewritten so that the, the legal challenges raised by blacks are no longer relevant and segregation is resumed. Okay. So these new segregation laws are upheld as constitutional and they last until the 1960s. But they show that people working through the system, through laws, can get things changed. Okay. So while that's happening, we see this man, maybe the most interesting guy in Florida in the 20th century. If Menendez can be the most interesting guy in Florida in the 18th century, this guy, Sidney J. Katz, lawyer, real estate agent, fundamentalist minister, becomes the only person in Florida history and in the nation to become a governor from the Prohibition Party. And Katz has this great slogan, Vote for me because you are the people who need support. You are the people who need support because everybody else is for the elites. So you, the riffraff of Florida, have only three people who care about you. One, Jesus Christ. Two, Sears Roebuck, because you can buy your stuff from there. And three, Sidney J. Katz. And Sidney J. Katz, at some level, is the precursor to Donald J. Trump. Sidney J. Katz walks around with a gun. Sidney J. Katz threatens um, the Palm Beach Post editor. Sidney J. Katz is against immigration, maintains that Negroes and German immigrants are in cahoots with Catholics to take over the state of Florida and move. You know, talk about conspiracy theories. Katz maintains that the Pope is going to move the Vatican to San Antonio, Florida, where St. Leo's College is. Okay, sounds crazy, but the man gets elected doing this. 1916 to 1920 is instrumental in getting prohibition passed within the state and pushing for it on a nationwide basis. So, you know, demagoguery does not start in the late 20th and early 21st century. Katz starts it in the late early 19th, uh, in the early 1900s. And certainly Katz is involved with the push for prohibition. And once again, we talk about democracy, voices and votes, the voices of the people push to get this passed. People want this passed and it gets passed in Florida. Okay, petition, petitioning the legislature, pushing it again. People power, that's what this is. Okay. And again, it's, it's a Christianized fundamentalist movement that is something that is passed both by the state of Florida and by US in the 19th Amendment. Tied into all this is among the worst incidents of racial violence in the state of Florida's history. And it's tied into voting, 1920. Voting has expanded dramatically because the 19th Amendment allows women to vote. And African-American veterans are coming home from World War I and saying, we fought and saw our fellow black soldiers die for democracy. Woodrow Wilson says, we are fighting to make the world safe for democracy. So why can't we vote here at home? So in Ocoee, Florida, in November 1920, an African-American veteran named Mose Perry decides that he wants to vote. He is prevented from voting at the voting, uh, at the voting uh, site. He comes back armed and says, I have every right to vote. He is chased away from there. He ends up at the house of a man named July Perry, and Mose Norman disappears. Perry is lynched by the white mob, angry that these people would dare A, to attempt to vote, and B, attempt to vote with weapons. Perry, um, Perry is hung as a sign for 
all black people to understand that they cannot do this. And the black section of Okoe is wiped out somewhere between 30 and 35, or maybe up to 100 African Americans are killed in the Okoe massacre. Um, this is this is from Walter White of the NAACP. And again, not coincidental that this happens right after World War I, right after African Americans are pushing to expand their right to vote, and right after the term of Sidney J. Katz. While all this is happening, women are pushing for the right to vote. This is May Man Jennings, among the most influential women in 20th century Florida, wife of Florida Governor um, William Jennings, um, governor in the first decade of the 20th century, but she's a lot more important and a lot more interesting than her husband. She pushes for all sorts of things. She pushes for prohibition. She pushes for um, protection of the environment. She pushes for migratory bird protection. And she pushes for women to get the right to vote. In 1920, after women get the right to vote, she becomes the head of the, the um, League of Women Voters in Florida. And you know, her husband dies early, but she dies uh, in the 1930s after um, Everglades National Park is pushed towards uh, becoming um, part of the national park system. A really important and powerful figure. You know, important because she is a governor's, an ex-governor's wife, so she's got power, but she uses that position to put, push to expand democracy for women. And certainly part of this is you know, women rights to vote. This is correction, uh, this bizarre um, utopian community in Southwest Florida around, around Estero, just south of Fort Myers. And again, this is a state park, go there. Once, once the, the state opens, go to Koreshin. It's an amazing, amazing place. But this is a place in which um, this communal utopian community in which women see themselves as equal and they push for votes for women through the voting system. And bizarrely, Florida, women get to vote in state elections or in local elections in 1915. Why Felsmere, which is um, in today in, in St. Lucie County, nobody knows. Why this woman gets to vote, nobody knows. But um, Felsmere has women voting four years before the amendment is passed and five years before they vote in national elections for president. So women are pushing this all the way. Um, People like Mary Nolan. Mary Nolan, the oldest woman involved in uh, the National Women's Party, arrested in 1917 for participating in um, activities against the White House. And certainly Mary Nolan is treated much more harshly than those people who were arrested for breaking into the Capitol. Okay, She is arrested for um, chaining herself to the White House fence and she is placed in a work, federal workhouse um, in, uh, in Northern Virginia, participates in a hunger strike while there, and she is force fed. And the vision of force feeding this elderly woman um, because she refuses, to, um, she refuses to eat because she is not being allowed to participate democratically certainly helps change the tide. And her, her quote here is really American, is really amazing. I have a nephew fighting for democracy in France. I should be proud of the honor to die in prison for the liberty of the American woman. Uh, you know, when you talk about people who fight for democracy, Mary Nolan in Florida is one of the leading her heroes. As is Mary McLeod Bethune, born um, to slave parents in South Carolina, at sharecroppers in 1875. She migrates to Florida just like everybody else does because it's warmer there and because there's opportunity. Establishes a school for girls, which eventually will become part of Bethune Cookman University. Um, by the 1930s, she is the most important black woman in America, part of FDR's um, part of FDR's black cabinet, good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. But in 1920, she demands the right to vote, not just as a woman, but but as a black woman. And as the Klan attempts to prevent her from voting, she stares down the Klan, standing there with her group of um, young African-American women students who are pushing to be part of a mainstream American society. And because of Bethune 
Cookman's, I'm sorry, because of Bethune's um, incredible advocacy and pushing for democracy, sh her statue will be in Statuary Hall um, in the Capitol, replacing the statue for Florida for um, Edmund Kirby Smith. And if, if we had some kind of thing, anybody knows who the other statue for Florida is, write it in the chat and we'll talk about who that is. So she will be the first black woman honored in the Capitol with a statue from the state. Okay. This is another African-American woman pushing for equal rights. This is Eartha M. M. White, um, who lives almost to 100, born in 1875, just like uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, dies in 1974, establishes the Clara White mission to help African-American women and men in Jacksonville. Um, and she is profoundly important in supporting the right for African-Americans to vote um, in Jacksonville and in Duval County. And then there's this one, which tells us the relationship of how problematic democracy is. Margaret Dreyer Robbins, um, a, a veteran of the um, New York trade union wars, a, a leader of the Women's Trade Union League, pushes for um, workplace equality for women, but also for the vote for women. And she moves to Florida with her husband um, in the 1920s, and they buy this house um, in Hernando County, which again, another place, a cool, cool, cool place to go to visit um, called Chinsugut Hill. And when, when you talk about irony, and I love talking about irony, this is an original um, 1850s plantation home owned by a man who owned African-American slaves. Um, and it is bought by the, um, by, um, the Robbins husband and wife, and they um, push for at, um, they push for equality for African Americans and for women so that they can vote in the state of Florida. Really interesting place, an interesting story. And it takes Florida until 1969 to pass the 19th Amendment. Of course, because it's national law, women can vote, but Florida finally only ratifies the amendment in 1969, showing us how far behind Floridians are in their push for democracy for women. But women take the opportunity not only to vote, but to participate in politics. This is the first woman legislator in the state of Florida, in the Florida House of Representatives. Um, Edna Giles Fuller, elected in 1928, um, re-elected in 1930. And you can see she's the only person in the legislature in 1921 who's not a white male. Interesting person, participates in helping um, prepare for World War I, participates in helping prepare for World War II as well. And then there's this woman, Ruth Bryan Owen, daughter of William Jennings Bryan, um, Democratic candidate for president like 11 times. Um, she moves to Florida because just like everybody else does, you know, it's warmer there. She comes from Nebraska. Who the hell wants to live in Nebraska in January, right? It's cold enough in Florida in January, right? Um, and she runs for federal representative in 1926, the first woman to ever run for that. She loses, but in 1928, she wins the election, becomes the first woman um, floor, a woman to represent Florida in the United States House of Representatives. She wins again in 1930. She loses in 1932 because she is a prohibitionist and prohibition is, is seen now as, as problematic. Um, as the Great Depression is coming around and we need to get money for um, money for taxation for liquor. But of course, this is Florida and her election is contested, contested by a man who maintains that because Ruth Bryan Owen is married to an Englishman, she is not an American citizen. Of course, there's the phone because I have a landline. So we'll just turn it on. Sorry. Um, Owen counters by saying this rule never would have credence if it was regarded for a male. And Congress takes it up and says that, yes, she can serve in Congress, but it's contested. So again, the movement towards democracy is always a, a battle of contestation. 
after she after she serves in Congress, she becomes the first female um, to become an ambassador for the United States, becomes ambassador of, to, the, uh, to the nation of Denmark. So a profoundly important person within the state as is this woman, Mary Lou Baker, another um, representative who serves um, in the state uh, House of Representatives uh, for two terms during the war, during the war, and pushes this thing called the Women's Bill of Rights, which says that women can carry on business while their husbands are away at war. Profoundly important emancipating women at some level, saying they're not under the control of their husband. The bill passes remarkably, and she is now installed in the Florida Women's Hall of Fame. Um, the other thing that she does is she does not have the name of her husband. She has her own maiden name. And in 1944, when she's running, her opponent says, what kind of person are you? All women have the names of their husband. And she says, I want to run on my name. My husband's serving in the war, he's overseas, and I don't want you guys to vote for me because you think my husband is fighting for the nation. I want you to vote for me because of who I am. So profoundly ahead of her time. Um, amazing, and exp again, expanding democracy. While that's going on, while Baker is serving in the Florida legislature, things are changing dramatically nationwide. Um, in a Supreme Court case, 1944 in Texas called Smith versus Allwright, the all white primary is declared unconstitutional. Now blacks can actually be involved in the primary situation. So therefore, previously, Republicans in the South were like nothing. So if you can't run as a Democrat, you might as well not run. This opens up opportunities in the South in general and Florida in particular, specifically for this man, Harry T. Moore. Harry T. Moore, head of two organizations, the NAACP in Florida and this organization that he establishes called the PVL, the Progressive Voters League. And he registers thousands, thousands of African Americans to be able to run, to be able to vote in the Democratic primary in the late 1940s into the early 1950s. For, for doing this, on Christmas Day, 1951, his house is bombed, he is killed, his wife dies three days later. The murder has never been solved. You know, assumptions are that the Klan does it, and assumptions are that even though this is in, in um, Brevard County in a town called Mims, that the white supremacist sheriff of Lake County, a man named Willis McCall was in, intimately involved in Moore's murder. So, you know, the book about Moore is called Before His Time because 1951 is before the civil rights movement really started and Moore does not get near the credit he deserves for being an advocate for democracy in the state of Florida and nationwide. And then there's this guy, mayor of mayor of Daytona Beach in the 1930s. And Armstrong breaks ground with most Southern people by allowing African Americans to participate in voting in Daytona. Unlike almost every black in the, in the South, they can vote on local elections. Why? Because he wants their votes to be able to keep him in office. And certainly his relationship to Mary McLeod Bethune is profoundly important. She thinks this guy's wonderful. He's running a political machine, but it's a political machine that's helping both whites and blacks in Daytona. And you can see um, that's Bethune's letter in 1929, how important um, Armstrong is. But you know, here we go. We talk about what just happened, happening in Florida. City Hall and Armed Fortress. Coppers hold riot guns at windows. The Battle of Daytona Beach over whether to remove Edward Armstrong from office or not, okay? Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. And tells us that what happened in the past month isn't an anomaly within American politics, okay? And Florida politics in particular, as, as exemplified by the pork chop game. These are rural, white, North Florida Democratic politicians who are determined to keep themselves in power and determined to ensure that they remain the brokers of the state. 
in spite of the fact that increasing numbers of people are moving to South Florida. And by the 1940s, these guys are maintaining their hold by malapportioning the state. Florida is the most malapportioned state in the country, which means that there is the same number of representatives from Baker County, which has like seven people, as Dade County, which has like seven trillion people. And the leader of the pork chop gang is this man. Charlie Johns. Charlie Johns, um, as I said before, Charlie Johns becomes governor because the governor dies. There is no lieutenant governor. He's president of the Senate. He becomes acting governor in the mid 1950s. After he steps down from governor, he runs for governor again and loses, goes back to the Senate and establishes among the worst examples of anti-democratic politics in the state of Florida, the Florida Legislative Investigative Committee, otherwise known as the Johns Committee, attempting to determine whether communists are infiltrating the NAACP and the civil rights movement. When they find that that's not the case, they move towards attempting to root out homosexuality in Florida public schools and universities. Um, and in 1963, the Florida Legislative Investigative Committee, the Johns Committee, publishes this lurid pamphlet known as the Purple Pamphlet, Homosexuality and Citizenship in Florida that these people are menaces to the state, menaces to the nation. Johns eventually has to be, um, is not removed from office, but Johns, Jones's, uh, Johns's power is reduced. And this becomes at some level a blot on the state. And it still is today. And, you know, people at the University of Florida were forced to resign. Students were forced to leave. Um, and the university has never apologized for its shameful actions regarding the Johns Committee. And the union at the University of Florida, the Rights Union, is still named after J. Wayne Wright, the university president at this time, who allowed Charlie Johns to come on campus and his committee to pull students and teachers out of classes and basically destroy their careers and their maybe their lives as well. So again, a democratic blot on the state. And at the same time, Bus boycott. We know about what happens in in, uh, in Montgomery. This is the Tallahassee bus boycott. Okay, Reverend C. K. Steele, black church, black students from FAMU. They force Tallahassee to integrate its buses. And while Johns and his committee in the mid 1950s represent a blot on democracy, these individuals represent an important push that people can make a difference and change America for the better. Tie in then, you know, this is family students, bus boycott and 63rd anniversary. This is from an, a series of articles in the, the Tallahassee Democrat, which apologizes for its participation in supporting um, opposition to the bus boycott and condemning it as, as racial, as fermenting racial unrest. So they have apologized for their participation against the bus boycott. And certainly it leads to the civil rights movement in Florida. And we don't know much about this and we should. Great title. It was never about a hot dog and a Coke. We know about Selma. We know about Albany. We know about Montgomery, right? We know about the University of Mississippi. We should know about what happened in Jacksonville. Axe Handle Saturday, a May Saturday in 1960, in which African Americans are beaten brutally by white mobs with axe handles as police stand by and watch what happens. St. Augustine, 1963-1964, in which African Americans attempt to integrate beaches and pools, and they are met with the owner of the Monson Motel pouring muriatic acid in the pool. And one of the leaders of this movement just died last year, I'm um, sorry, last week. Um, and it, crazy, I mean, this is to tell you how she got involved. She was a young woman in Southwest Georgia, involved in the movement struggle. They asked her to come to St. Augustine to help integrate these pools, because guess what? She could swim. So she was brought down there. And, and we have this wade-ins in the waters of St. Augustine Beach. Police going in there and clubbing people for daring to integrate beaches in St. Augustine. 
And on that same plaza of the Constitution, where the monument to liberal democracy is, now is this foot soldiers of the movement monument, um, memorializing those people who fought for democracy in the streets of St. Augustine. With that, in 1965, maybe the most important law ever passed regards voting is passed. The Voting Rights Act, passed by Lyndon Johnson, um, which gives opportunities for African Americans to participate. And you can see states with a history of discriminatory voting, parts of the state, Florida's right there. And African American participation goes up astronomically with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And with this, a Supreme Court case, first in, in the state of Florida, then all the way to the Supreme Court, Swan versus Adams, 1967, in which um, the state of Florida is forced by the Supreme Court to remove its malapportioned districting and get it districting so that it is more reflective of the way people and where people live in the state. Um, it gets breaks the power of the um, breaks the power of the pork chop gang and allows people from South Florida uh, to be able to express their voices and their votes in a much more democratic fashion and allows for a whole new generation of politicians like Lawton Childs, like Bob Graham to come into power and to move the state away from Jim Crow. Um, profoundly important. And um, James Kynes, you know, lawyer, and University of Florida graduate. So, um, and in the midst of all this too, Maxine Baker, we see what women can do. Maxine Baker, another Florida woman in the House of Representatives, pushes towards the Baker Act. And today we see the Baker Act as a problem where, oh my God, you know, it's almost, it's almost a cliche. Oh my God, that person's acting weird. Let's Baker Act them. She pushes that as a way to improve mental health care. So we can see that things that maybe are pushed for positive change can be used for other ways. And while, again, while all this is going on, Florida is changing dramatically from the one-party state of democratic rule. Bill Cramer is the first Republican Floridian in Congress in Washington, D.C. since Josiah T. Walls in the 1870s. Serves from the 18, uh, 1950s into the 1970s in St. Petersburg, an area which is getting increasingly more northern uh, people from especially the Midwest coming down there bringing uh, desires for small government and low taxes and Kramer becomes this important figure. And Claude Kirk, um, the first Republican governor again since Reconstruction, since the 1870s, governor of Florida from, eight, uh, from 1966 to 1970 and marks this transition that um, David Colburn, um, my good friend who passed away um, unfortunately, um, fairly recently. And, and um, this book explains what's going on here from Yellow Dog Democrats. And that's what Florida was. The title comes from the words, you know, I would vote for a yellow dog if they were running as a Democrat. I don't care if Jesus Christ was running as a Republican, I will vote for that yellow dog to red state Republican. The transition from Florida from completely Democratic to the state that now at some level is purple. Okay. And maybe even completely Republican. And Republican senators like Paula Hawkins, um, the housewife from Maitland, Republican senator from 1980 to 1986, the first Republican woman um, in Florida to be in the United States Senate, the first um, woman to be in the United States Senate from Florida, and the first woman in, ever in the United States Senate who's not associated with her husband. Okay. Here she is, you can see there with Ronald Reagan. So, you know, this is bipartisan, this notion of expansion of democracy at some level. And when we talk about women in Florida, and their importance to democracy, you can't not talk about the two Marjorie's. Never held political office, but yet are two of the most important political figures in Florida in the 20th century. Their environmental activism stopped the two largest federal projects ever stopped in American history. Douglas helps to stop the um, 
the Miami jet port in the Everglades, and Marjorie Harris Carr helps to stop the um, cross Florida barge canal. And it's 50 years ago today that Carr's activism forces Richard Nixon to issue an executive order stopping the cross Florida barge canal. So when we talk about citizen activism, we talk about these two people and how they can make a difference and how democracy works. Okay. So really important individuals. And you know, you want to read a great book, read Marjorie Stoneman Douglas's Everglades River of Glass, River of Grass, written in 1947. If you don't want to read the whole thing, read the first chapter and the last chapter, because they're incredible. And then there's Janet Reno going to the Democratic side. Okay. First female attorney general of the United States, served both terms of Bill Clinton's administration uh, in the 1990s into the year 2000. Comes out of Miami, um, state attorney, you know, important figure in South Florida, um, known also you know, for the horrific events of the Ilian Gonzalez story in, 19, uh, in 2000, when Gonzalez is returned to Cuba, um, becoming a political pawn between the Democratic Party, Bill Clinton, Janet Reno, and the very powerful Republican bloc of, of um, Cuban American Republicans in South Florida. And when we talk about democracy, we talk about the expansion of what it means to be a citizen. And certainly that has to do with people with disabilities. People with disabilities who were systematically disfranchised from voting, A, because they were thought they were not intelligent enough to do it, and B, because oftentimes people with physical disabilities could not get to the polls, right? Polling places on the second floor, polling places is a place where you got steps, people in a wheelchair cannot get there. So when we talk about expanding democracy, we don't talk about just, you know, people of color, marginalized communities, we talk about the disability community itself. And I think that's important. And we also talk about those people who are coming to America. This is Freedom Tower in Miami, South Florida's Ellis Island, in which thousands, hundreds of thousands of Cubans come to Florida with their feet by plane, by boat, to escape what they see as Cuban terrorism, Cuban communism, and become part of the American democratic ideal, the American democratic system. Become American citizens, and participate in democracy. And with that, we have, again, Cuban politicians. Mel Martinez, who comes in here um, in the 1960s as part of this um, incredible program called Operation Peter Pan. Marco Rubio, who will tell us that he comes here to escape Cuban communism. His parents came in 1956. Cuba doesn't become communist until 1960. Tell us the truth, Marco, sorry. Um, but. Mel Martinez is the first Cuban American to be elected to, to the Senate. Eliana Ross Layton, the first Cuban American woman to be elected to the House of Representatives, serves 14 consecutive terms. Last term is, is in, um, ends up in 2018. So important figures. And not just Cuban Americans serving from Florida, but Haitian Americans, the first Haitian Americans to serve as um, mayors of American cities, as um, as um, which is Philip de Rose, mayor of North Miami, and Josephat Celestin, who is the first person, uh, first Haitian American to actually serve um, in any position within a city in Dade County. So not just Cuban Americans, but Haitian Americans as well, serving, uh, escaping their lands and coming and becoming part of the American democratic system. And then there's 2000. We talk about democracy in Florida, you can't not mention what happens in 2000. Confusion at the polls, voter suppression, bad ballots, the butterfly ballots. Florida becomes a laughing stock. Florida is the state which wins the election for George W. Bush um, by the narrowest of margins, less than a thousand people. Okay. And you know, when we talk about problems in voting, this is the original problem here, right? 2000. And since that point, Florida has worked towards restricting 
voting laws. While the Voting Act, Rights Act of 1965 expands voting, Florida has passed restrictive laws since that time to prevent people from voting. And mostly it's about Amendment 4. Florida passes Amendment 4 so that felons can, who have served their sentence, can be allowed to be back on the voting rolls. This was passed as Amendment 4. Florida is still in the process of attempting to put these people back on the rolls, and they have not been able to do that. You can see how many individuals in Florida, compared to every other state, are not allowed to vote because they have a felony record, and they have served their sentence. Okay. So voting's a right. Voting is a right. Voting is an opportunity for black people, for white people, for poor people, for wealthy people. Democracy matters, okay? Democracy matters. And voting rights are civil rights for those people who are working in the fields of Immokalee or those people who are living in the villages. Voting is a right and it's part of that democratic process. And this is where my talk ended three weeks ago, four weeks ago, five weeks ago. I voted. I voted. The importance of voting. Vote here. This is where it ended. But then this happened. Earlier this month, democracy under attack. Democracy under attack. And I don't want to get into the politics of this, but it is truly awful that we had to witness this, that the democratic process is being subverted by people attempting to take the law into their own hands, by people desecrating the halls of Congress, by people marching with the flag of white supremacy, by people dressed like Halloween, for God's sake, and for Floridians who think this is a game, okay? And this picture's in here because this is a Floridian. So while we see this, I don't want to end with these horrific stories. I want to end with this, that democracy beats the powers of violence and darkness, that these are people lining up, young people lining up to vote, young people lining up, old people lining up, people in wheelchairs lining up to participate in democracy, to assume that we have democracy in America. And as I said, it's something in progress that we still have to work for. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Noel, for that really fantastic presentation. Um, I'm sorry it was so long. No, no, it's it's absolutely wonderful. And so we're going to try to get to a couple questions if we can. Again, if you do have any questions for Dr. Noel, feel free to type them down in the chat and then we'll uh, try to get to as many as possible. Um, I do want to address one of the questions that was asked early on, which is about this notion of backdoor politics and having it be around since around 18th century, like the 1760s. Oh, yeah, I, I, so, I think it was, it's been around forever. You know, certainly, certainly um, backdoor politics, the politics of wealth and privilege uh, have been around forever. And um, <clears throat> the assumption is that we have to expand the political system and allow other people to, to, to participate. Um, and that is done through peaceful protests. And I think, yes, it has been around forever. And certainly um, the fact that, you know, we look at, at we look at people and the relationship, um, you know, this guy's father served here, this guy's uncle served here, and that's okay, you know. But certainly it's a closed system that is gradually expanding. As I tell my students, you know, the history of America is about expanding the notion of what Jefferson meant when he said in the Declaration of Independence in, in 1776, um, all men are created equal. Okay. That meant something very different in 1776 than it means today. That's what America is about, expanding that notion of what we are, of who we are. And that's what it's about. So. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the other things I wanted to um, talk about this evening, we talked about this before we came on the air, some of the uh, things that you specialize in as a historian. And, and one of those particular areas is um, the, the history of disability. And I wonder if you could just tell our audience um, how you first got interested in studying the history of disability and some of the things that you've sort of 
learned that might have surprised you or uh, things that you just didn't really expect when you started? Well, to, to well okay. You know, at, at some level, um, I got involved in the history of disability because I, I worked at a summer camp in high school and college for for um, kids with um, with intellectual disabilities. And, and um, I got involved in it and interested in and, and then ended up teaching special education in the public schools of Alachua County um, after I came down here to Florida before I came full time to UF. But I think to me, the most interesting thing is that there is a disability rights movement. And the disability rights movement mirrors the movement for civil rights, move, mirrors the movement for, for women's rights, move, mirrors the movement for, for, for Native American rights, uh, mirrors the movement for um, the environment, um, and things like the, the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act passed in, in um, 1990. You know, the assumption is, well, you know, every, every able-bodied person saw how problematic it was and how hard it is for people with disabilities, so we're going to help them. Well, no. People with disabilities put their bodies on the line, um, advocated this through peaceful civil disobedience, um, buttonholed congressmen, wrote petitions, wrote letters, and participated in, in activities that basically forced the hand of um, forced the hand of those people uh, in power to do this. So um, I think, you know, we know Martin Luther King, right? We know um, um, Betty Friedan. We know um, the people involved in the civil rights movement, but we don't know people like Ed Roberts, um, who, is, who is the father of and, and Judy Human, the, the father and mother, as it were, of the disability rights movement. And you know, their story needs to be told just as much as, as the story of, of, of um, the civil rights movement. And I think, you know, that's that's my goal in many of the classes that I teach. Um, to, to get that story out there and to tell people that that's as much a part of expanding um, democracy as um, giving voices to other marginalized groups. And related to talking about the, the courses that you teach, sort of along those lines, you mentioned that uh, you're teaching a particular course related to disability this semester at UF. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a course called Race and Disability in American History and Literature. And, and I, it's wonderful because here I am, this old white guy. And I'm teaching it with a young black female English professor, um, you know, and it, 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 it's really interesting. We're looking at how history impinges upon literature, um, reflects the way literature is written and how literature reflects society. So um, it's, it's really, I, I think a, it's a very interesting course. We've taught it once before. Um, we taught it two years ago when the world was open and we're teaching it now when the world is closed. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see how it works um, under the, the constraints of, of COVID. But, but I think it's great. Uh, um, it, it's really been a positive experience, I think. Yeah, and it's, it's certainly really interesting. And yeah, you know, I also wonder in doing all this research and, and you being an expert on you know, modern Florida history and, and diving more into the politics. Um, do you still feel like Florida plays a role in determining what happens nationally as far as politics goes? Well, well certainly um, the person who, the two people who really put that out there are um, the late, great David Colburn and um, Gary Mormino, who, who taught at, at USF St. Pete, who, both of whom are my mentors. And I, you know, I, I cannot express my um, appreciation for how much they did for me and also how much they did for Florida. You know, they're the people who put it out there and said, you know, Florida is the bellwether state. Florida is the state uh, of the future. You know, when we talk about urban history, we don't want to talk about 19th century Chicago. We want to talk about 21st century Orlando, because that's what the modern city is going to look like. Um, you know, when we talk about, when we talk about um, marginalized groups, we, we talk about people like those farmers in Immokalee. When we talk about um, differentiations of, of um, race, we talk, and Florida's got, you know, Blacks, they, they've got African Americans who are fighting with um, Haitian Americans as to who, who who's really Black, right? So Florida at some level is profoundly important, not only because of those reasons, but because it's also got so damn many people. You know, third largest state population wise. So um, it is at some level the future. 
And um, I think it's really important to see what Florida politics and history looks like, because I think it is what American politics and, and, and the future will look like. Absolutely. And I wonder, sort of a, a last question um, for the evening, is there a particular Florida political story uh, that really fascinates you? You mentioned a number of, you know, most interesting men, and I think most well, of Sydney J. Katz. I mean, my, my, my students just say, oh, God, we got to hear about Katz again. Um, oh, my God. You know, I think Katz's Kat, story and, and his um, is profoundly important. Um, I, I think the, the story of Harry T. Moore and, and the black struggle for freedom is, is what is, is, is really important. Um, but, but maybe the story of Marjorie Harris Carr and, and her, her use of the legislature and just the, the great story of Carr is, and I've heard this from maybe five different um, powerful men in, in both government bureaucracy, but also elected officials. And their thing was, if you ever see Marjorie Harris Carr, try to make sure you're not wearing a tie, because Marion, uh, because uh, Marjorie Harris Carr would come up to you and grab that tie and hold on to that tie and would not let go until you had to listen to her talk about protecting the Florida environment. Then she would let go of your tie. So I think that's a great story. I don't know how it would fly today, but certainly, you know, it's it's a great story. So um, I think you know, and that that's what what this stuff is about. It's about making a difference through particip through citizen activism and participation. You know, that no one thought that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas could stop the jet port in South Florida. Nobody thought that um, the civil rights movement in St. Augustine could stop Jim Crow. And yet, you know, they did. Is there work yet to be done? Profoundly, based upon what happened earlier this month, there's lots of work to be done. But certainly, you know, the hope and possibility of an expanded polity is profoundly important and energizing. I mean, no question about it. And I think you you laid out a really energizing story um, in your presentation tonight. So okay. again, we're really grateful for that. Um, I did provide a link to the op-ed that you wrote um, in the Tampa Bay Times in the chat. So anyone who is interested can yeah. read more about Marjorie Harris Carr and, and uh, her work to stop the, the cross uh, Florida barge canal. Right. The interesting thing about that thing is that for three days, it was the most the most viewed link on the top of day Times site, um, which tells you that people are, are still concerned about environmental issues. Um, and I think that that's at, at a time in which the assumptions are that it's not, I think it's important. Yeah, absolutely. So again, thank you so much for a really fantastic um, uh, program with us this evening. And for everyone who's at home and, and joining, thank you again for participating with us as well. As I mentioned at the beginning of this program, you will receive a short survey um, just asking how we did and ways that we can improve next time. And if you're curious about more programs that we're doing around the state, you can go to floridahumanities.org slash events to see the most up-to-date list of events on our events calendar. So again, thank you so much for joining this evening. Okay, let, me, let, me bring in, let me bring in Hugh. This is Hugh. <laughs> this is Hugh Manatee. And Hugh is the mascot of all my programs with Florida Humanities and with my summer programs with, with UF Humanities. So Hugh's here with me and um, he enjoyed the program as well. So thank you guys. Um, and for my students who are there, thank you guys. I realize you came here for the extra credit, but hopefully, um, hopefully it was worthwhile. So thanks. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to seeing you and Hugh again, hopefully in person sometime soon. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope. Let's hope. Thanks. All right.